here we go. Here's me. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, my name is Sarah Zucker, AKA The Sarah Show. If you spend any time on NFT Twitter, you may, you may recognize my lovely long-standing avatar here and all her lady boss finery. Uh, <laughs> this is an artwork by my spouse, Bronwyn Lundberg. And the reason I'm here today, I believe, uh, is because I have been editioning my artwork as NFTs since early 2019, which has given me this very unique, very psychedelic <laughs> viewpoint uh, of this entire phenomenon as it began with uh, a very small number of art nerds like myself, <laughs> just experimenting and, uh, you know, blew up into the, the zeitgeist that we all know today. So a bit about my artwork. Um, <laughs> this is my art and this is, this is for Esther who, who loves cats, I hear. <laughs> um, my artwork could be described as digital analog video visions. Um, I make use of the interplay of obsolete and cutting edge technology to evoke a dimension of my own imagination. Um, I have been working with digital and screen-based art for over a decade now, having started originally as a photographer. And um, I've sort of seen this entire moment, you know, of, of screen-based art, or as Nato was saying about performance art, in the past, we occupied this very strange no man's land of the fine art landscape where uh, folks could, you know, admit, yes, that is fine art. But since we didn't fit neatly into the gallery model, it was often hard to uh, be acknowledged or supported as such. Um, I've been in Los Angeles for about a decade. I, I used to curate a visual music show called Prism Pipe. Uh, maybe some of you are aware of, uh, that used to play in Echo Park and was a celebration of video and GIF art at a time when animated GIFs were becoming ubiquitous on the internet. And yet those of us creating them were still sort of being treated like, you know, a bunch of punk kids smoking cigs behind the gym. Like we were not treated as serious artists and it was seen as sort of sacrosanct in a way. And um, so, so my artwork, again, I, I've really leaned into the use of uh, obsolete mediums, specifically VHS. Um, and it's not just because it looks cool, though it does look cool. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's, I see the use of these vintage mediums as a type of aesthetic intervention. You know, it, it takes the viewer, it's something that's recognizable, it's something of our collective past. Uh, and so it grabs people. It's, it's this Trojan horse of nostalgia, you know, that, that makes the viewer sort of open up. And then I sneak on in there with my little sneaky Cheshire Cat artist ways <laughs> to bring them these ideas that I'm channeling from my own experience. And so as an artist who, who began editioning my work in this way uh, back in 2019, I could see from those early days that, that NFTs are a very simple technology at their base. They are simply a container. That is, that is all they are, and yet that is truly revolutionary uh, considering that they are able to contain things that previously have been considered non-objects. Screen-based art is a non-object-based type of artwork Therefore, it was always very difficult to collect in the past. It's not to say it wasn't done, and I know you're gonna hear from people today who've talked about the history of, of collecting digital and screen-based art, um, but it, it, was, uh, it was not at a large scale, shall we say, um, prior to this ability to create a container for this type of artwork. And so in the early days, and um, I first began releasing my work as single editions on the marketplace super rare in April 2019. And uh, I've had the good fortune to release work through many of the major platforms uh, and try them all out and see, see what they all have to offer. 
in those early days, it was it was something that was, in theory, a way to get support for our artwork um, because we could recognize, you know, just as a photographer would make a print of a photograph and then be able to sell that print edition to a collector, we as digital artists were now making these editions of our artwork and could sell them to theoretical collectors that might one day exist. Um, I often joke that in those early days we were like fraggles, uh, you know, like that you'd get a pebble from your friend and you go, oh, what a beautiful pebble. And then you'd, <laughs> you'd go to your other artist friend and go, here, I, I want you to have this beautiful pebble. Uh, because we were all <laughs> sort of trading the same $50 worth of Ethereum between us and, and collecting each other's editions. And why that's, while that's incredibly like adorable, uh, you know, very Care Bear sort of way of being, I look back on it now and realize we were essentially establishing proof of concept for what has now become a multi-billion dollar market for NFTs, both in the landscape of fine art and, and in the landscape of collectibles. So that's a bit about me and my, and my history with all of this. And I've, I've clung on, I've clung through it. Um, uh, you've heard others mention that, that last year was sort of the big watershed moment. Uh, in February of last year, there was a $69 million sale of an artwork or cumulative artworks of the artist people at Christie's. And what was so strange about that to me, and I guess unexpected to me as someone, again, who, who began working with this technology before, before people, uh, and there were a number of us who were back then, um, is, is I just wasn't expecting it all to mature as quickly as it did. And I was not expecting it to have the backlash that it had. Um, not exactly in the way it did. And those two things are correlated, right? I think the fact that this matured as fast as it did, as fast as it did, is inextricably linked from the coronavirus pandemic. Um, in March 2020, I had been minting my artwork for about a year at that point. And I don't think that it is a coincidence that March 2020 uh, is both the t point in time when I had to go inside like everyone else uh, and stop seeing my friends and stop going places. And it is also the point in time where I, for the first time in my life as a professional working artist, began selling my artwork regularly. And, um, you know, it, it's funny, there's an interesting correlation even to the Renaissance, right? If you, if you look at the Renaissance and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, very positive people <laughs> in this space on Twitter who love to make these comparisons to the Renaissance. Uh, and some of them are maybe a little overzealous, but the one that I think holds a lot of water is this idea that the Renaissance followed the plague, right? The, the, the Italian high Renaissance followed a plague that like decimated Europe. Um, and so I think in a certain way, we're seeing a similar thing here. There's this interesting push and pull in society that we endured this and are continuing to endure this very intense social juggernaut that was COVID. And pushed pushed culture like through a play-doh spaghetti making machine into all these odd shapes we weren't expecting and so with the closing of galleries with the cancellation of art fairs uh, everyone had to go online and everyone was terrified and looking around and going well what now what does life look like now and there were those of us who were already extremely online and we went hey hey everybody <laughs> we're here come on over, we have something to show you. And it took about a year and it, and it, it really took, it really gained steam. So I bring this all up because what I want to show you today is uh, a series I made in March of 2021. Um, my art practice is often transmuting uh, intense things I am personally grappling with into humor and joy and delightful weirdness. Um, 
So in March of 2021, with all of this grand noise suddenly around me uh, and my own experience of my art practice leveling up uh, in a very intense way, I created, oh, I created my series called The Cassandra Complex, which is a story at once ancient and familiar. Uh, this is a style I work with. She's not animating, but imagine it. Um, this is a style I work with that I've developed that I call video paintings. Uh, and I specifically create these using a, a vintage video painter device that I begged my parents to get me for Hanukkah about every year in my, <laughs> my childhood uh, and eventually got one for myself. Um, so it's all created on VHS tape. These all exist, phys all my artworks exist physically in that way. Um, but I like to do this dance between the material and the spirit realm uh, where the work becomes digital. And so the Cassandra Complex was uh, the first of, of what I'm now thinking of as sort of portfolios. Um, again, my background as a photographer gave me this gift entering the NFT space, realizing these are just editions. That's it's very simple. Um, a lot gets made of them, like they're the second coming or they're the antichrist. They're additions. And um, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It is a huge deal, but it's also not that big of a deal. Um, and so, so yeah, so the Cassandra Complex was a, a way I was already in March of 2021 starting to see a lot of these early works I had released, these single editions I'd released on Super Rare started reselling secondary market sales. And already I was as an artist um, contending with, okay, it's time to evolve my practice a little bit. There's a lot of demand for my work and it's never been my intention to only make art that is available to a very you know, select few uh, who are able to afford certain levels. And so I created this series as a way to, uh, again, thinking about like photogra uh, photography portfolios, a way of telling a little tale, a little allegory through my art uh, in these limited editions. And it began with this piece, uh, which I called a, a launch card, the Cassandra Complex. And this was actually available open for five minutes. These are sometimes referred to as open editions. Uh, this launch card mechanism is something I, I came up with in conjunction with the platform I was releasing with, this was released on its own smart contract, standalone smart contract, through a platform called Blank Art. And we wanted to do this idea of the launch card uh, almost like as though if you were to go to a vernissage of a, of a show, you would get, you know, maybe like an exhibition card, a little something that was with some artists in time, even those little ephemeral postcards become valuable, become, you know, collector's items. And so that was my thinking with this. And it was available for 0.1 ETH. It was available at a very um, affordable price point for anyone who wanted one. And it was a way then to go, I really want people of varying levels to be able to participate with this mechanism. And so uh, a quick primer on the Cassandra complex and what it means, if, if you're unfamiliar. Um, I often work with myth and I kind of infuse my personal experience and vibe with myth. Uh, Cassandra was uh, a princess of Troy. Um, and in the myth, the, the way to sum her up is she was given the gift of prophecy with the curse to never be believed. And so you may see where I'm going here with this. <laughs> and and I'll, start, I'll start us off here with our, oh, there we go. That's how she looks. Um, so this is the first edition in, in uh, the Cassandra Complex, Apollo's Gift. Surprise, this gift is really a curse. Um, so Cassandra was, you know, a priestess of Apollo. And Apollo gave her this, this gift of prophecy to go, guess what, girl, you can see the future. Isn't that awesome? And she was like, yeah, cool, great. And, uh, and then he was like, also, you know, by the way, like, you know, could I get a little, could I get a little something, something? And she was like, oh yeah, no, like, sorry, I don't think of you like that. Like, 
<laughs> I thought we were just friends, you know, like didn't realize I like had to put out to like get, um, you know, favor. Cool. Awesome. Hashtag me too. Um, and so, <laughs> so this is my little take on that of like a present, a gift that contains a little stank on the back end. Uh, surprise, this gift is really a curse. Apollo was mad that Cassandra wouldn't put out, so he said, oh, okay, well, yeah, you have the gift of prophecy, but no one's ever gonna believe you. And so uh, that story has played out for, for people, early adopters, early visionaries, and just, you know, women <laughs> throughout the history of time. Um, so this was this was the first edition, and then and then the second edition in this series. It's Cassandra's vision. Oh, the ecstasy! You know, she can see how it all connects and what is yet to come. This is this is her, my 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 visionary, my version of of Cassandra here. And you know, I am not saying I am Cassandra. Uh, I want this. You know, it's open for interpretation. I do think uh, again, knowing when I created this project, and it was speaking to really collectively the experience of being an artist, having been a professional working artist for a decade at that point, and, and knowing uh, how revolutionary this technology would be for artists as a class of people. You saw earlier NATO in, uh, was showing you uh, things and, and you saw the very first NFT by Kevin McCoy. Uh, it was done through an experiment, I believe, at iBeam in New York. Um, I saw that in 2014, and that was around the time I was curating this show, Prism Pipe, of, of GIF and new media artists. And I saw these experiments they were doing with blockchain. Uh, the Ethereum blockchain wasn't even live yet in 2014. And it just like clicked for me. It was like, oh my God, this is going to change everything for people who do the kind of work that I do. And there are a lot of people who do the kind of work that I do. We get lumped into this sort of insulting title of being called content creators, sort of dystopian way of saying artist. Um, you know, because historically, or at least for the during the Web 2 era or the social media era, we were seen as the providers of the content that which is what made people want to go on social media. And yet we were put in this position, uh, the artist writer Rips made a great graph about this that I saw maybe around that time, that at that time, the way we as artists who worked in the digital realm supported ourselves was we would make cool shit and then we would wait for emails. And that was it. It was this sort of faith-based workflow of if I make something cool, if it goes a little viral, maybe I'll get an email from Doritos and they'll ask me to make like a, you know, cool ranch chip gif. And that's how I'll, and then I'll support my art studio. That's how I'll make, you know, that's how I'll make this work. And that's, I, I consider myself one of the fortunate artists that that did sort of make that work for a long time. Um, and so again, I, I found out about NFTs in 2014 the Ethereum blockchain launched in 2015, and that was when I started seeing, you know, these these groups, these new media groups I was involved with, people starting to debate theoretically what this ability would mean for artists, because the Ethereum blockchain was also the advent of what we call smart contracts. Again, a lot of this can feel very arcane. Uh, smart contracts are just like regular contracts; they just exist in a way that can be implemented on the blockchain. And so I just knew, I was like, the second this becomes available to me, I have to experiment with this. Um, I was very involved, my work was very, has gotten a lot of views on Giphy. I've had 6.8 billion views of my GIFs on Giphy. That's like almost the population of Earth. <laughs> and yet people often ask me like, well, how much, how much money did you make from that? And I go, that's gonna be a zero, my friend. <laughs> That's gonna be a zero on that. And that was just standard. That, and it still is standard for most artists that you are paid in this faith-based concept of exposure, that your work is seen, therefore you should be grateful. And yet 
the image I use for that is like having a running faucet that's just shooting resources out, but you don't have a bucket. You don't have a bucket. You don't, you don't get to collect any of those resources. You know who does have a bucket? Facebook. <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're talking about here. It's, it's absolutely something that um, it's on a social level. And to me, this, this project specifically, Cassandra Complex, was speaking to the experience of being an, a member of the artist class and having this oracular moment of, whoa, 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 this little thing is going to snowball. And it's, it means a big, big, big difference for artists, digital and otherwise. Well, so that was the fun part of it. And then, and then, <laughs> and then here's what happened, guys. Here's what happened in March of 2021. The queen says, no, she says, absolutely not. We cannot allow these ideas to take hold. I don't like it. I don't like what it means. I reject it completely. And um, the queen here to me represents um, a lot of different folks and really a sentiment more than anything. A sentiment that I think, again, like, like anything myth-based is as old as humanity itself. And that sentiment is one that goes, I'm seeing something new that I don't understand that is definitely changing the way the things I'm in control of are handled. Therefore, I do not want it. I did not order this. Please take this back to the kitchen. <laughs> I don't care if this is what's for dinner. I don't want it. Um, and for me, when I say I was surprised by the backlash, what, what really surprised me was that there were so many, um, there were so many people who I had long known to be champions of the digital arts who, when this moment happened, uh, this moment meaning the Beeple sale, the, the proverbial rock being lifted up and all of us little critters being exposed to the light. Um, people who I had long known to be champions of the digital arts joined in with the chorus of voices saying, this is bad and these are bad people doing this. And I got to tell you, my experience being there and at that point already being very well regarded within the community, uh, the NFT community, and, and having, again, having a, a long history of my own experience in, in art at that point, it encouraged harm towards artists. And people were getting death threats. People were being attacked. I had a number of artists I had curated who I had a good relationship with who were sending me violent messages saying they thought I was a bad person, that I was working with this. How dare I work with this? Didn't I know that it's, it's bad? Everything about every single thing about it is bad. And um, it's something that I hope will be discussed more today. I would by no means tell you that this is a perfect technology. We are in the dial-up modem era of this. It is clunky. It is inelegant. It often does not work the way we want it to work. Uh, as was mentioned, it's not. It's having difficulty scaling now that so many people want to participate in it. But this was something that was pioneered by artists, and I guarantee you that artists are still the ones driving it forward. They're still the ones taking up these tools and 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 out of their own just artistic curiosity, going, "Ooh, ooh, what can we do with this?" and to me, that's like, that is one of the most beautiful aspects of humanity, that we have people like that who, who get that way about the things that scare the shit out of everyone else. And, um, and I guess my feeling on it was this sort of thing, specifically with seeing uh, arts institutions take this angle of new, new, no, not those NFTs, those are bad bad things by some bad boys. Absolutely not. Like we are not, we are not deigning to dirty our, our little paws with those. 
um, in my sort of oracular moment, recognizing, well, you're going to have to. Like, it's, <laughs> it's not going to go away. Uh, I, I knew it, once this became, once I started seeing it on CNN, on BBC, like I was like, I thought we were like five years out from all that happening, but COVID like put it all into overdrive. And once the lid was off Pandora's box, that's Pandora's box, you know, you can't put it all back in. And so, uh, this was me. This is my, this is how, this is the level of anger, uh, that I allow myself <laughs> a silly um loser drawing of because i was i felt very um betrayed in a way because i've always been someone who yeah who who cares a lot about about the fine arts so um so it was just it was it was just something to reckon with there and so this is this is the last edition this is how i processed all of this and how i when i sort of put my mind to it how do i think this story is going to go and I'm standing here in front of all of you. It's a year later now, year and some change. And I think it has gone exactly this way. And this last edition is called Turns Out She Was Right. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of, uh, again, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's also like dork-sided uh, that this is historically how these stories always go. You know, the prophet, the witch gets burnt at the stake. The queen gets her head chopped off. Meanwhile, the people celebrate the new ideas, you know, that Pandora's box is never going to contain everything in it again. Once the ideas are out, they're out. These are ideas that touch almost every aspect of our culture, not just fine art. This is a better mousetrap. When I said that smart contracts are just contracts, that's, that's true. So when you think about how much of our life and society is governed by contracts, now that we have a more... Um, ironclad way of enacting contracts between people, which again, I, artists are pioneering it because as was mentioned, artists are the ones who've historically been even innovating ways a person can get screwed. Um, that, uh, you know, we are now here a year later and the fact that all of you are even here, I think a year ago, people would have been scared. People were scared to even be associated with NFTs. People were scared because the violence, the the activism that was, you know, uh, really violence in in masquerade uh, was so intense and so severe. And it's still there's still a lot of it that I think people, even if they were curious about NFTs, understood that it was one of those social no no's. It was like, don't touch that. That's a scarlet letter. Like you'll be you'll be laughed out of your institution or laughed out of your house. <laughs> and so um, this is how the story has gone. And uh, happy to report, again, this is why I say artist is a class. This is not a directly personal narrative, um, that a lot of artists did suffer. And a lot of artists specifically of marginalized backgrounds suffered the most because they were asked to answer for this thing. And they were kind of getting it from both sides that the NFT space, just like all spaces, has issues of inequality. That's not unique to it. Uh, it's just, it's humanity. It's a space where humans are. Um, and so I think that here, here we are, you know, a year later, and this is out here. And I think that that, that is a good thing. Uh, and I'm just glad that I was able to be there and I was able to document this, document this feeling, this experience because NFTs are gonna become more and more and more woven into our culture. They're going to become less visible because they're just gonna become the in, you know, part of the infrastructure of how things are run in our increasingly digital world. And um, it's just been, it's been a joy. It's been a joy to get to be there at the, at the front of it, even if it was a little bumpy at times. So that's all I have to say to you today. Thank you all for coming out and listening.